you may or may not be the problem in your relationship, but you are the solution. And this is a, an emphasis I put. I put all the weight on the guy's shoulders to actually make the relationship better, which is counterintuitive. Usually it's the women who are taking the emotional leadership. But I say, guys, stop trying to figure out who caused this fight or this situation or the kink in the connection. Don't worry about that. Don't put your attention on that. You're the solution, though. So what can you do in terms of a leadership role to bring the two of you back into connection? Because that's what it's all about. We don't want to go through life fighting with our woman with the like this mini Cold War going on. Like Life's too short. Um, so, yeah, I put a lot of that pressure on the guys to, to lead the two of them out of any kind of relationship dysfunction. And as you said, don't play the victim. All right, fellas. Uh, pumped about my conversation today with G.S. Youngblood. Um, what a class name. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be talking about several things today that I know all of you will appreciate, one of which is leading from your masculine core, a subject that we've explored here on the show. And based on the feedback from the audience, we know that we could continue to have some incredible conversations, the art of embodiment and how that might impact your relationships. Um, my guest again, his name is GS Youngblood. If you went into Amazon and type the name, you'll find a couple of books that he's written, um, masculine in relationship and, and art of, and the art of embodiment for men. Um, one of those, we read through some of the, the reviews and they were quite exciting to see how his audience reacts to the books. One said, no more sitting on your meditation pillow and wondering how the practice is going to help you in real life. This book shows you how all these practices can transform you into the person you are looking to be. Uh, another one, after doing men's work, martial arts, meditation for a decade now, the book is a catalyst to bring my growth game to the next level. It just went on and on and on. It was really cool to see the impact of GS's work. Um, most importantly, GS is a father of three. He's got a 21, 19, and 16-year-old, and uh, after a divorce 13 years ago, found his now partner that he's been with for 10 years. And I also want to recognize my buddy, James Ashcraft, for introducing us. Um, James is the president <laughs> of the EO chapter here in Austin, a good friend, hey, has helped, helped Front Row Dads to grow. He's given us uh, some coaching and consulting on the vision and the future of this men's group. And I'm really, really grateful for James. Um, he said, by the way, GS, that you crushed it when you, I guess, spoke to his group, Yeah, which was great. Yeah. That's why, yeah. why I got the nudge. Um, so when GS is not with his family, he is leading workshops, both online and in person. He's coaching men to develop their masculine core and to develop their deepest sexual energy, which I'm excited to talk about that subject today. I think we'll lead with that in just a moment. Um, his work in the domain of masculine leadership pulls from a variety of fields, um, along with one of his, uh, with another man that he has studied with and knows very well, John Wineland, who we've had on the show. Um, he has studied psychology, spirituality, martial arts. I love this one too, tango. We threw tango in there. Oh, That's yeah. cool. I spent some time in Argentina. Meditation and BDSM, not a subject we've explored a lot here, but I'd love to dig into that a little bit. Prior to all this men's work, GS was a former Silicon Valley exec, had a few exits along the way, um, but that's not why we're talking today. We're not talking business or tech. We're talking men's work, relationships, and all the things I mentioned previously. But really what I want to explore, and we'll see where it goes because it's always, it's always uh, in the moment, but some of the things that I've read about about GS's work, taming anxiety, healing trauma, this dark sexual energy subject, uh, the masculine blueprint that he put together, relational masculinity. What does that mean? How do we define that? And also something that caught my attention, conquering the nice guy tendencies. I think that that's something I've had to work at in my life. So that's it, guys. I'm glad you're here today listening to the show. And by the way, if you dig it, write a review on the show. Uh, mention GS's name and um, tell me where your address is and I'll send you a copy of his book for free just as a as a gift to the listeners and a gift to GS and thanks for being on the show GS welcome thank you John excited to be here man I feel I feel in alignment with what we're out in the world trying to do and help dads help dads have a better life have a better relationship and uh, and of course be better dads and so much of it comes down to our work, right? Like we're not victims of our marriages. We're not victims of our children. We're not victims of our communities. I mean, there's, there truly is, I suppose, if you want to make an argument, 
by definition that there are victims along the way, but, but playing the victim or using it as a tool to deflect our own growth isn't something that I'm, I'm trying to do in my own life, man, is take responsibility and not say, well, if my wife would change, I would feel different. Or if my kids behave differently, I wouldn't lose my shit. (laughs) Yeah, it's so true. And and we play the victims even when we don't know it. Uh, It's just sort of hidden behind our motivations. And I have a I have a couple of quotes from the book that that speak to that. And, and one is, you may or may not be the problem in your relationship, but you are the solution. And this is a an emphasis I put, I put all the weight on the guy's shoulders to actually make the relationship better, which is counterintuitive. Usually it's the women who are taking the emotional leadership. But I say, guys, stop trying to figure out who caused this fight or this situation or the kink in the connection. Don't worry about that. Don't put your attention on that. You're the solution, though. So what can you do in terms of a leadership role to bring the two of you back into connection? Because that's what it's all about. We don't want to go through life fighting with our woman with the like this mini Cold War going on. Like life's too short. Um, So, yeah, I put a lot of that pressure on the guys to, to lead the two of them out of any kind of relationship dysfunction. And as you said, don't play the victim. Yeah. And it's, you may not be the problem, but you can be the solution. Is that what you said? You you may or may not be the problem, but you are the solution. Not yeah, yeah. You are the solution, man. I, I love that. Um, that's what I keep wanting to figure out for myself is, and I almost need, I feel like sometimes I need the coach or I need brothers around me to, to tell me when I am unconsciously playing the victim. Yeah. Because I think I'm taking responsibility. I think I'm trying to be the solution. But maybe, maybe in a blind spot in my life, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, 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 I am playing the victim. And my, I, my question, although I wasn't intending to lead here, but I think we just went here, is that <laughs> how do we know? Do we need to be in relation with other brothers, with other counselors, or can we do this on our own? Is there a way that we can look in our in a mirror and see what we need to see, or is it just impossible because you can't read the label from inside the bottle? Well, it's, uh, I love that analogy, by the way. Um, You can develop the capacity for self-reflection to a certain degree. And so you can, you can, you know, train yourself to learn a lot. So that's one, but that's not everything. You're, You're definitely going to get some reflections from your woman. There's just no question about it. And you can learn to open to those and see what you can learn about yourself and your impact on the world. Um, And that's valuable. And, And so let's now put that over there. But that's still not going to fully replace the need to be with your other brothers because your brothers can give it to you hard. Uh, well, that's not a terrible. Your, your brothers, your brothers can. Nobody's can signing up for your workshops. Yes. <laughs> wow, this took a wrong turn. Um, yeah, and your brothers can give it into a way where you're going to be open to it more as yeah. if your woman comes and, and gives you a hard truth. It's it's much harder. So. It's it's not do I need them or do I not need them. It's like look at the value that other men can bring you. So yeah, I, I recommend that every man be in some form of men's group. That's not just kind of you know a few bros sitting around talking. It's about guys with depth, and that's that's actually the hard part is to find guys with depth. But get guys with depth into your life, and if you have to do that through people you know and you kind of self organize, or if you need to to pay in some commercial arrangement, there's lots of you know. Uh, paid men's group opportunities. I'm creating a community later this year, but there's others out there as well. Find a way to get yourself around other men who will give you reflections out of depth and uh, and it'll pay off. All right, so here's where I did want to lead. And I'm just going to take a hard right turn to get into this subject. Because when I was looking through your stuff and I alluded to this in the intro, Mm -hmm. um, something that I don't think men talk about a lot And when they do, I think it's a bit uncomfortable is this, this dark sexual energy piece. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's impossible to build a bridge from what we were just talking about to that. And maybe it's, it's more connected than I'm giving credit to, but this idea is something that I just want to make sure we cover today because Mm -hmm. I want to know how it is all connected. I want to know what this means. So maybe by pure definition, but also like, why do you teach this? Why is this an important part of men's work? Yeah, let me, I want to give you, so it's definitely jumping in the deep end just to go right to the dark sexual energy. Um, How about if I do just a one minute on the blueprint to kind of set that up and then let's just jump right into exactly what you asked. Perfect. Okay, so my, my, I have a 
model of masculinity that makes sense to me. And that's what I share with the world. And, and, and it's in the book. The book is, is written around a three-part blueprint called the masculine blueprint. And the first element of that blueprint is respond versus react. So that's that quality of groundedness with inside of you. Uh, there's a stillness and a choicefulness to how you operate in life. And it's just palpable. And, and, you know, you contrast this with guys who are really reactive and they quickly get defensive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's the opposite of what we're talking about. So we start with respond versus react, which is groundedness and stillness. Element two is provide structure. So this is that quality of clarity and directionality that a man brings to his life and the lives of those around him. And this is in contrast to a guy who's indecisive or he's, he's often saying things like, well, what do you want to do, babe? And he's looking for her, for her direction, rather than looking inside about it, around his own inner clarity. So that's the second element. And the third element is create safety. So this is physical, financial, and most importantly, emotional safety. And that's, you know, a woman, we're about to jump into the topic of sexuality. A woman's not going to have an open heart and an open body for you if she's not trusting and feeling safe. And there's no bigger determinant of her openness than her level of safety that she's experiencing with you. And there's all kinds of ways that guys crush the, uh, now I won't use crush because that has two meanings that we really obliterate the emotional safety within her by some of the things that we do. And that's what I try to teach guys in the book of how not to do that. So that's the, those are the elements um, that I think are the definition of what masculinity is, at least from my point of view. Now, dark sexual energy. There's a lot of nice guy tendencies in, in men in their regular lives. And you know what I'm talking about. We, you know, all of us at times have, have, fought that tendency to be agreeable and just do what she wants to go along, to get along. Um, and um, we all know that doesn't work. Most of the women who are, have any kind of awareness, which is, which is pretty much all of them, they're just like, Ugh, it doesn't feel good. And we, so we think we're being good guys and we're really starting to drive them away. And that's certainly where I went in my marriage way back when, you know, I was just trying to dance around things to keep the peace with her so that we could keep the train on the tracks, ended up driving her away even more. So those nice guy tendencies can actually leak into the bedroom, you know, where a guy's, you know, he's, he's sort of tentative on how to initiate and he doesn't know how just to, you know, forgive the term, but just take his woman. And of course, we're talking about consent and a loving consensual relationship here. So that's our context. This is not, you know, somebody you meet. This is with your, your partner. There's consensuality. Um, it's chosen and all of that. So all that's assumed in anything that I say. So a lot of women experience their men as nice guys in the bedroom where they're, yes, they're tender and they're gentle and they're accommodating and they ask her what she wants. Um, but it's, it's to a lot of the women that I talk to, it's, it's unsatisfying, you know, because a lot of cases at times they're wanting to surrender into his strong direction in the bedroom. They want him to bring a little, not the, the light caring, but a little bit more of the darkness and, I'll talk quickly about this dark light. All light is just like it's kind, it's caring, and and that's a necessary ingredient. But by itself, it's it gets to be super boring really fast. All dark leads to things like misogyny and potentially sexual abuse and and not so good things. So each of those um, uh, energies by themselves actually has a real shadow side to both of them. And what the feminine is craving is some a man who can bring the combination of those two. So can you be attuned to her and caring for her and taking care of her body and knowing what feels good and what might not feel good or might hurt her? Can you have all that awareness and bring the that like, <clears throat> you know, it's it's that leadership. You're leading the action in the moment. You're bringing her closer to her sexual edge, which means different things for for different people. Um, there's a command presence to it. And that's, I think, one of the key elements. And it's not all like super serious. There's like a mischievousness to it. That's another flavor that, that goes in dark energy. So this is what I'm trying to work with guys. Like, how, do, how can you go from nice guy in the bedroom into uh, bringing the dark and the light? Not just one or the other, but the dark and the light. And uh, <laughs> I'll just say that 
it's usually pretty transformative for a relationship when the guy starts to develop some of these capacities to bring it into the bedroom. So I'm aware I just monologued there for a while. So I'll pause for a second. Oh, it's great. I think that, and what I'm also going to attempt to do is to, like you've done so well in creating some context, like, hey, this is a consensual relationship we're talking about. Um, you know, there's elements to this that if somebody were to just take a sound bite, it might not sound good by itself. But when you have the context of the conversation, that's what's so important. Yeah. If I'm if I'm further expanding our context, I'm also feeling like the bedroom is just a, in some ways, a metaphor for the entire relationship. It, it's just a place where we play and discover and find our edges and understand our standards, our asks. It's another platform for us to have both disagreements and resolutions and find ways to connect and please each other, whether that's in a conversation with somebody or paddleboarding with somebody. Um, th th it feels like all of those are just different playgrounds for growth. That's, that's what it feels like. So when we talk about dark and light energy, we're, we're not just talking about it in the bedroom because when I, what I understand, and, and I want to get your take on this, so I'm, I'm sharing my perspective to see if you can either poke holes in this or expand on this, is that mm -hmm. I had to learn a couple of years ago, I felt like I learned a couple of years ago, that sexual energy is creative energy. The act of sex is that of life force creating potentially another human. It is the very root of our existence as the human species. And so when somebody is engaged in a sexual energy with another human, that energy, creative life force energy, um, can affect lots of things in your life. If you're sexually charged, if you're, sec if you're attracted to somebody and doing that dance, you can bring that into other areas of your life because there is simply a creative energy around it. Am I seeing that correctly? Do you have thoughts on that? Because I'm, I'm trying, I'm attempting to expand, like, we're not just, just trying to improve your sex life in the bedroom. We're yeah. trying to improve your entire life by talking about sex. Yeah. Yeah. I love where you're taking this and I'll, I'll, I'll go even bigger just as it relates to my work. Um, there's a lot of work that I do to, to, to ground guys down and empty them out first of all the, all the nonsense that goes on inside of us. But we have to fill that with energy. And, and part of the work I do in my workshops, my live workshops, is really getting guys to be able to embody more energies. Uh, because guys, we, we kind of smash ourselves down into a pretty narrow band of, of expression and what we feel inside. So what we feel inside and what we express externally, we kind of smash ourselves into a, a pretty narrow band. You know, you and you don't see a lot of guys where you can just kind of see their unbridled joy. You don't see a lot of guys that really let their anger out, not in a not in an unhealthy blasting way, but in a powerful chosen way. You don't. That's pretty rare. You know, guys often can't embody their 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 uh, their um, like their tiger sexual energy. You know, where they're just that real sexual desire. A lot of guys really clamp that down. Um, uh, you sadness, shame, you know, there's a, a claim, you know, claiming your woman in the bedroom. These are all energies that a lot of guys don't know how to embody. They don't even know what they are because they spend a lifetime not feeling. And so they can't feel shit inside of them. So what I try to do is really help them find those energies and start to embody them and amplify them and externalize them, be able to show and express those. Because here's the thing, John. Most women can't really feel their men. Their men appear kind of like a little bit of a stone to them. And that's very, very painful for the feminine. They need to feel you as well as experience you sort of more uh, logically as well. And um, this is a real problem. So a lot of guys, I mean, you know guys like this. Some guys, they just feel alive. And they feel really embodied. And other guys just feel sort of like a, like a digital screen. We want you to be that embodied man. I, I, I talk of it as, as being more primal. When you can feel the depths of your sadness, when you can feel the, the heights of your joy, when you can feel the power of your sexual desire, when you can channel your own healthy anger and externalize those in healthy ways, you become a primal man. And that's the man that women are attracted to. That's the, the, the man your wife is attracted to. That's the man that other men are, are drawn to in, in his leadership. 
that's the primal man and, and this ability to feel and embody energies is part of that. It's not, it's not the whole picture, but it's part of that. So I think that leads to what you're talking about is the sexual desire and the command presence and those energies are the ones that manifest in the, in the bedroom. And we want to do that, but this is part of a larger effort to, to be more primal in every aspect of your life. And so I, I think that's where the, what you said and what I teach to men really tie together. How do we learn to feel more? What is the practice of embodiment? How are we tapping into more joy, yeah. more, more sadness? And, and, and yeah, what does that look like in practice? Well, it's, it's hard to tell a guy, hey, you need to feel your emotions more because most guys are like, eh, exactly. whatever. You know, like, so I, I take them through a more uh, accessible path, which is through feeling your physicality first, which is what embodiment exercises primarily are. It's about feeling the physicality within your body. Mm. Um, and so once you, once you start to be able to feel the physicality of your body more, it's, it maps over directly in your ability to feel your emotions more. So we kind of come in through the side door. That's a little bit more accessible to men because we go through the door of physicality that leads to being able to feel more of your emotionality. And, and so that's why I say, man, the most important thing you can do if you want to build your masculine core is start a daily embodiment practice, which is why I wrote the book, which is why I created the video course based on the book, because um, I'm pretty obsessive about men doing embodiment practice. It's, it's so important. It's the best thing you can do to, to build your masculine core. When did you originally find this and what was your journey into it? Like, tell us about the stubbed toes and, you know, what did you call bullshit on? <laughs> and like, uh -huh. you know, when did it finally make sense? You're like, I got it. What, what does that journey look like for you? You mean all of this work or you just, did you mean? Just yeah, work? that, that yeah. work, like the work of embodiment. Like when you, when somebody's like, yeah, you need to feel your body more. And you're like, what the fuck am I feeling in my, like, I mean, just tell me more about like your practical experience stepping into yeah. this work. Yeah. Where, where was it clunky and where did it work? Yeah. Well, it all started coming out of that divorce, which was kind of ended in a pretty bad ball of flames and was a, it was the most painful chapter of my life. And so it, it started in pain. That was what the, the soil in which we potted the plant. And I knew there had to be a better way. So I went through a whole phase where I was really doing a lot of meditation. And I found that meditation was, was good, but it was hard to stick to. And here's why. You know, meditation, it's like, here's the mind. And that mind needs to notice the same mind thinking thoughts. And then that mind needs to say, okay, hey, you, me, myself, because it's the same mind, telling itself to stop thinking those thoughts. And you can see sort of the spin cycle that, that just... It doesn't catch for a lot of people. I mean, you're nodding. So I imagine you've tried meditating and maybe. Totally. Yeah, it's hard to stick. Well, that's where embodiment uh, comes in because instead of trying to notice and let go of thoughts and push them away, you're actually just taking your attention and turning it towards something tangible, which is a physical sensation in your body, like a specific one. Once you do that, the, there's no room left for the thoughts. The thoughts just get gently pushed out. They're the, the thoughts are the last one standing when you're playing musical chairs. There's just no, there's no awareness left to, to attend to that kind of uh, thought activity. And so that's why when I, when I started to get exposed to embodiment, um, I started to learn that. My first exposure was, was through my partner. Um, she is, I mean, she's been doing embodiment for 25 years. It's a practicing osteopath. And she really started to introduce me to some of these practices. And that was, um, that was eye-opening for me. And then I continued it with David Data. I continued it with John. And John showed me a lot as well. And, um, and then I started to really innovate on my own. Because the truth was, all those sources got me started. But there, I, I was left kind of dissatisfied because I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't love how it was always taught. It didn't totally land for me. And so in the, the book, The Art of Embodiment, I really codified kind of my different take on things and where I think the attention really needs to be. It's not about like the latest, coolest kundalini practice that you've learned. You don't actually need a lot of, you know, a lot of variety. You actually need to pay attention to the principles underneath some very simple exercises. And that's where you make the most, the most uh, progress. So that was kind of the, you know, the long path to, um, to the work that I do in particular, the embodiment. And I'll just say this last thing. When I became, you know, quote unquote, religious about it was when I started to see the benefit in my own life. 
and started to see me become more grounded. And I noticed that the world just looked a lot easier after that. Not that it's not that it's always easy, but it just things got a lot easier, especially in that relational space, because I'm in partnership with a pretty powerful woman. She's very feminine and got a strong masculine, too, from her father. And uh, I have to dance with both those parts of her and embodiment absolutely helps. Do you still get triggered these days? Like, do you lose your shit? Do, is there is there moments where you're like, dude, I teach this work and I'm still not, I'm still reacting. Hold on. I've got to adjust, adjust my golden glow <laughs> that is around me. No, I never get triggered. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. And I, here's the, here's the very simple reason why I'm in relationship. Yeah. And I'm in relationship with, as I said, she's a very powerful woman. So she's not a wallflower. Um, but it just continues to go down year after year because we do a lot of work together. You know, we're very active about working on the relationship and developing our own capacities. It gets better all the time and it gets easier. And, you know, this is a big deal, John, because you, you get together with a woman, you love her, you marry her, you know, and then it, things start to get rougher and rougher every year. And suddenly you're just you're, you're missing out on all that awesomeness that you you were attracted to when you met her and wanted to get married to her or, or whatever the commitment level was. And so our reactivity, it's not our fault. You know, it's not because we're dickheads. It's because we've got some wounds from our mm. early days that we haven't addressed and they cause us to flare up. They cause us to not see what's actually happening, but some movie that we project onto what's happening. Everything gets amplified because of the wounds, and then suddenly we're not who we want to be. We're this reactive person. The potential for guys to improve their relationship is so immense if you just tame your nervous system. So all the dads out there, guys, don't, don't read another book, okay? Do the embodiment work to really start to tame your nervous system. Do the hard work over a couple of years. You're going to see your life change with your job, with your wife, with your kids, and whoever else is in your life, it's totally possible. And I think that's the message of hope that I'd want to give all guys. Your life can be different. I didn't think my life could be different until I had to go down in a ball of flames and rise again and learn all these new ways of being. Your life can be different without everybody else changing, just you doing the work. Yeah. What, what do you see as the pattern of a core childhood wound amongst the men that you've worked with? I've heard people pitch it as like, there's five core childhood wounds. There's like abandonment and rejection and whatever else they would label them. But do you see a pattern amongst men? Like, is there a more common childhood wound they're dealing with? Is yeah, that it's either I'm going to be left or I'm not good enough. Yeah. And both trigger a state of absolute terror. Now, you may yeah. not know it because your mind has, has learned to tamp all this down. But under here, you're like, it's like a duck, you know? You might look normal here and, and underneath you're just, you're boiling with terror, um, not cognitive terror, but down at the somatic level in your nervous system. So it's, it's usually those two. And so what that means is men are always in, in terror of their woman's disappointment. Our women's disappointment is like kryptonite for us guys. And so if she complains about this one thing that's not, that's not working for her, we often, because of our wound, we tend to globalize that, that she's questioning our competence as a whole or our manliness or our worth. And that's super scary. When we take one complaint here and then we globalize it to everything, because then we start reacting with the level of energy that's as if she questioned our entire worth, even though in a lot of cases, she's just saying like, I don't, I don't like that you park your truck, you know, six inches into the other spot because I can't get the car in the garage. You know, something as simple as that can turn into even a, a big fight because the guy thinks he's, his whole worth is being questioned. And again, it's just, it's the amplification of our childhood wounds that makes threats seem bigger than they actually are. And so in the, in the book, the masculine in relationship, but also the, the video course I'm just releasing now, I go in deeply into the, into this notion of threat and trauma and anxiety. And there's a whole cycle that I, I, I hope I explain really well. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me and a lot of my clients. Um, but I explain that whole cycle and how you break out of it. Nice. Yes, this is a good moment to pause. Um, so GS, with all of this, I, I'm imagining that relational masculinity 
is something that might be a bit of an umbrella topic or might cover a lot of what we're talking about here. And yeah. I, I've heard you say, and I really appreciated this, that there's there's not just masculinity. It's the type, the type that might show up when you're by yourself, when you're surviving in nature alone, when you are with your brothers, when you are fending off, you know, a bear. There's elements of masculinity that might you you might define or, or see. Um, but what about relational masculinity? What about the masculine that shows up inside the relationship? Yeah. 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 Let me just speak to some of the different types of men's work that are out there. And, you know, there's, there's, I mean, most guys, no, I shouldn't say it like that. Lots of guys, I'll say, you know, they start out as nice guys and then they, you know, they think, oh, well, I, I want to do something different. I want to be more of a man. So let me go out and try to find some men's work that helps that. And, you know, there's lots out there. There's, there's some guys who try to be masculine, but they're so, you can't see my fist. They're all balled up, but it's like, they're so tight. Like their version of masculinity is just to be kind of really tight and rigid. It's like they're, you know, a Marine Corps, um, uh, you know, they're in the Marine Corps because they're just like so tight, but they do that in their real life, not in their, in their combat missions. And that's not masculine because somebody who's in relationship and is that tight and that like clenched is it, their woman's not going to be able to feel them at all. And at some point she's going to, she's going to grow really disillusioned of a, a relationship with that kind of guy. Um, there's a lot of work about being more alpha that's out there. And, you know, it's, I see it as a younger form of, of men's work. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, you know, qu the qualities of the alpha are actually very important. There's, the, there's a clarity to an alpha, which is really powerful. There's a, there's a directionality to somebody who's, who's a natural alpha that is, is very admirable. Those are qualities that you want to take. The problem is a lot of the alpha stuff that's out there is, has basically turned into kind of being a dick to everybody, but, you know, trying to be the guy that's in charge. It's not very relational. And when you get into relationship, you, if you try to be the alpha in, in a relationship with a strong woman, it's not going to go well because, because it's not very relational. And that's a real problem. There's, there's masculinity that's kind of this new agey. I can't even call it masculinity, but it's a new age version of, of men um, where it's really about repudiating traditional masculinity because you think it's all bad and you think it's all toxic. And each of these guys is, is kind of trying to one up the others to repudiate these qualities of masculinity that are very important. And uh, there was like a, a Dove soap commercial that was about, no, no, it was, uh, was it Dove or maybe it was Bonobos? It was one of these companies that they had a commercial where it was just all these guys repudiating masculine qualities and then trying to call that masculinity. And that's the that's this version of of a definition of what it's like to be, to be masculine that I I don't accept for myself and probably drives me the most nuts. There's there's what I would call sovereign masculinity. This is kind of the, I think the sweet spot. This is men getting together, giving each other reflections like you and I talked about. Um but it's still the kind of a man still unto himself. Now he's with his brothers, but it's, he's still not in that intimate relational space. And I think the sovereign masculinity work is super important. Like I think Traver's stuff is really falls into this category and it's so powerful. I love what he's doing out there, but you've got to go one step beyond that. And this is where I'm teaching in, in what I call the re it, relational masculinity. And so this is how can I be fully in my own power and be relational with other, you know, in this case, use the other as our intimate partner, but it doesn't always have to be. And that's what I'm teaching. And I think uh, there's a lot of the other forms of masculinity that don't talk about the relational aspects enough. And I think, I think at some point, especially with your audience, because these are dads, and they're, you know, presumably a lot of them are in relationship, whether it's the wife or, or, you know, uh, a subsequent relationship. This is what I'm trying to teach guys. Like, how do you be with a powerful woman, be in your own power and be relational with her? Not be a, you know, not be a nice guy and just give in to keep the peace, but actually be powerful, but also account for her as well. Be attuned to her, incorporate her power and her direction, but still bring your leadership to the to the relationship. So, you know, I talk about uh, life leadership uh, in in the, the the course that I have out about relational masculinity. I talk about sexual leadership and I talk about emotional leadership. Those are three of the big areas that I'm teaching guys how to be more powerful and more relational. 
so that's where this whole relational masculinity uh, title comes from, because I, that, that's kind of the term that encompassed my work that, that I like to use. Can you give us a real example, whether it be your own or a client that shall not be named by name, you know, but just a, a real example of when somebody did it wrong and they did it right. Or, or they were ineffective and then they were effective. And I would love if the example were from somebody who felt they were an alpha. Like, you're like, hey, in my life, I, I definitely resonate with being an alpha person, they might say to themselves, right? No problem yeah. leading, no problem, no problem taking the reins. Um, and I know there's a lot of combinations of relationships that could exist here and energies that are at work, but I'm just looking for a real example of an alpha person, if I'm able to say that, right? Like, I'm just making sure I'm framing this correctly. A powerful <laughs> man in a relationship, not wanting to lose his confidence in his, in his decision-making and his alpha tendencies, but he wants to be a relational masculine energy. What does that look like? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a generic example than I think you're asking for, but it's so common. It's, it just, it spans situations where she's like, Hey, I'm not liking this thing that you're doing. And, and the guy immediately fires back. Yeah. Well, if you weren't doing this, that wouldn't be a problem. You know, like there's this, like, if you weren't, you're the problem and I'm not going to tolerate that shit out of you. Like her expression might be a little messy and he's just like, I'm not tolerating that shit out of you. You know, this is your problem. If you hadn't done that, I would I wouldn't have had to do what I did. Okay, wait a minute. GS, can we use me as an example here? <laughs> can we like okay, this is yeah. let let's here's a here's a real example from my relationship. Lately, one of the things that's happened is I feel like I have been I'm asking myself what my standards are in my relationship. As yeah, I yeah. grow, 48-year-old man, two children, a 13-year-old, and 8-year-old, I feel like I'm evolving as a person who will, within myself, tolerate less than I did years ago. The people pleaser in me is not yeah. as strong as he used to be, right? I am, I am addressing this nice guy who is just like, I even said to my wife, this is real, this is true, by the way. Several weeks ago, I told my wife that I've resented her for 16 years because I didn't really want to get married when we got married. I only did it. We were already engaged, but the actual wedding, she moved faster than I wanted to. It yeah. was, I mean, it's a long story. We ended up getting married in, in Siberia, which is where she's from. And, my, you know, we did it so fast that my parents weren't able to make it over. And like, Isaac, I never really addressed, because I was like, whatever you want, baby, whatever you want. But that was my pleaser, not yeah. like, Hey, no, I really want to take some time, think about this and make sure that my parents are invited and all this stuff. It was like, let, let's just do this. Cause it was like, we have to do it while we're there before we leave. So yeah. her mom gets to see it. So I, but I've resented her for that. Now what happens is lately I've been less of a pleaser and my standards have changed. So our relationship is changing because the things I used to tolerate, not like I'm a victim, by the way, I'm not saying that like I tolerate her, but in myself, certain type of dialogue, I'll say, I'm not participating in this anymore. I'm not participating in this dialogue anymore. Right? Not and, and I'm trying not to do it as a fuck you. Yeah. I'm trying to do it as an honoring to myself that I no longer want to do this dance that we've done for a long time. We do this conversation. I say this, you say this, we do this thing. It's like a whole routine. I don't want to do that anymore. So I am like drawing a line saying I'm not participating. Am I being a dick? Am I being, uh, do I have integrity? And I'm now saying, look, these are my boundaries. You can play as you wish. You might leave, you might stay, you might change, you might shift, but this is my boundary. And I guess I'm testing yeah. my model on you to understand like, I want to be masculine, which, yeah. right? And I don't, I'm not trying to fuck up my relationship. Yeah, exactly. So let's, yeah, I love this. Let's balance those two of, of wanting to be masculine and powerful and have boundaries and stay connected. Like those yeah, are the two right. things. That you, yeah. Yes. So it's not what you did. It's how you did it for the most part. I, I have, to, I mean, based on what little I know. Yeah. Shoot me straight. GS. <laughs> yeah. It's like, look, I'm not participating in this. I can't deal with this. Talk to me when you're, when you're calmed down and you walk out. That's not very relational. Okay. Correct. It's not very relational. What did you, what, what is it you're not, you're not, that's not working for you? 
in the relationship, the, like in that moment, like what am I bowing out of? Well, what's what's shutting you down or pushing you away? Is she being a bitch to you? Is she is she insulting you? Feels uh, like blame. Okay. It, what it feels like is that so much of what's being said is like you, 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 you do this, you do that. And I'm like, I, because I'm trying to do this for myself, because yeah. my standard has changed that I'm trying not to say the word you, at, uh, right? But I feel this is me. These are my boundaries is my stuff. I'm now less tolerant of when she expresses yeah. herself that way. She's always like, well, how do I express myself if I can't use the word you when yeah. you're the problem? <laughs> You know yeah, what I mean? I do. Yeah. yeah, this is the this is one of the most insidious or, or sorry, insidious um dynamics is the blame dynamic. Yeah. And you know, it, it, when you're in the moment, there's there it's often very difficult to deal with situations like this. It's better to handle it before the actual fight is happening. And you know, one of the instead of like, look, you blame me, we're done. We're done, the conversation's done. I want to like you can set that hard boundary. It's not very relational. What you can say is, baby, here's what I'm noticing about myself is when you when you tell me it's my fault that I notice myself close and I'm less open to you. And what I see myself opening to is when you actually just share your own pain of, of you know, what's what what you're, you're experiencing rather than saying it's my fault. And I just noticed that I open one and I close on the other. Mm. So now you you get in. There's a flavor of self disclosure, which I think um, is not something that that the alpha model really has space for. It's like you're actually disclosing something about you, and, you, and the more you talk about you, that's on both sides, hers and yours. The more powerful the conversation can be, the more accessible it is to her nervous system when you start to share about you. And so I think self disclosure is a is a quality that men could actually uh, play with more and start to bring more to the table. Um, rather than just the hard boundary. Don't get me wrong. I think I, I, I think I may have uh, not made this clear. Boundaries are super important. But the, is the boundary like you give him the Heisman, or do you, or do you open and say this is my truth for mm -hmm. me, and here's what I, here's what I can't live with. How could we work through this? So it's inclusive. It's connected. It's open, and it's powerful because for a man to stay in and set his boundary without. Kind of like, okay, I'm done. And then scooting out of the room. That's powerful to stay in connection and be like, what's that like to hear when I say that, baby? You know? So I think self-disclosure is one of those elements that that really can be very powerful in this relational masculinity realm. So that's I think that's one comment I would have on your situation. Let's play this out one step further. So a guy uh is listening and i feel this way a little bit too so i'm projecting for sure but it's also i can imagine men saying yeah gs like i because a lot of our guys are well read they listen to stuff that are they've done work they've come to retreats like a, a portion of the men some men are brand new to this work of course mm -hmm. but the guys who have done the work they might say to you i can just hear it now right i i'm with you man I've heard that. I understand the open close. I understand revealing in that way. And I've tried that mm -hmm. and, 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 and crickets. Like I did that. I was like, baby, you know, when you, when, when you do this, I close, when you do this, I open. And then they're like, and I did that three times and yet still no change. Mm -hmm. So then my, then my dickhead comes out where I'm like, fuck it. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> What what is there a moment when you would say to that guy, yeah, if you've if you've expressed this three times, five times for two years, like where does a guy know that he's like, I gotta stick with it, I gotta stick with what yeah. I'm being taught, I've got to share, I've got to stay open, I've got to be relational. This is a season, I gotta weather the storm. And when is it like, hey, this person is just different? We're just yeah. not aligned. Like when is divorce the right move or separation yeah. or time apart? Or when do you're like, I'm not participating in this conversation anymore because I've said that to you seven yeah. times. I'll, I'll, I want to give an answer that's based in kind of the statistics of my client base or the okay. men that, that I've worked with. When behaviors like this persist, when it just seems like never ending and she's always just poke, poke, poke. That usually means there's a deeper feeling of either lack of trust, lack of safety, or lack of being felt and understood by their man. And more often than not, the man is ignoring something that he's been, some way that he's been hurting her, 
Usually, I mean, usually it's because he usually gets defensive instantly whenever she brings anything up. I got to be honest. In 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 the preponderance of cases, it's the man not being relational. I, I'm not saying that everything's the man's fault. Like we shouldn't take it like that. But when it just keeps going and and you like try to bring your best self and like she's just like poke poke poke, it usually means there's some well of pain back here that hasn't been actually addressed. So we'd have to do more of an inventory of the relationship to understand sure. this rather than the generic dynamic you described. We'd have to do a real inventory of the relationship. Usually it's because he's not receiving her and her state and her pain. You know, he immediately gets defensive or immediately tries to fix or immediately goes informational. Um, and then over time, she's just like, fuck you, you know, that, and her and her heart closes, she closes, and then she just badgers you. So I'd say let's do a relationship inventory and let's go really actually try to explore the ways that she's really hurting and then that, mm. that pain of that hurt is starting to squirt out into unrelated interactions between the two of you. Dude, I love this idea. And I, and, and I don't think I've ever done this. I don't think I've ever taken an inventory of the ways that I hurt her. Like, it'd be interesting to go sit with her, you know, after this conversation. Uh, and just to say, tell me all the ways I hurt you. Do you think that's... Am I... <laughs> am I and, and, brother i mean what, do, what like, do you think about that like this is what i'm this is my note to myself right now go yeah. talk to tatiana and be like tell me all the ways i hurt you and really yeah. hear her and not defend myself and not but really address that yeah you you i will say this you may not even realize the the importance of what you just said yeah. I'm, I'm i mean you were sort of kind of laughing when you said it but i was feeling the the weight of all the feminine pain in the in the world that would be helped by what you just said as a man going to his woman and really having a discussion about some of the ways that he that he may have hurt her over the years. Look, we hurt each other. So it's not like she's all per perfect over there and it's us as the flawed ones. She's got her ways that she hurts her, but that's not what we're doing here. We're doing men's work. So we're going to work on us. So what I would say to what you said is fucking a and absolutely. And here's what I'd say. I'd say bring something to the table rather than just asking her. So go go sit quietly for 20 minutes, have coffee, and mm. see if you can find a way that you think you hurt her. And then own the fuck out of it. Be like, yeah, baby, I, I'm remembering back to when, you know, you had our second son. And, and I, you know, I like, sh literally, I showed up late for the birth. And you were so angry with me and I was so defensive. And that must have been horrible for you because I know how vulnerable, I mean, I, I, I can imagine how vulnerable it is to be alone when you're literally in labor. And I imagine that just hurt you deeply. And I would just, I want to acknowledge that. That's what it would sound like. So bringing something to the table first, as opposed to showing up empty handed and saying, how did I hurt you? I think that would be the one tweak I'd make. It's kind of like going to a dinner party. You don't show up without, you know, a bottle of wine or something. So, um, yeah, that would be super powerful. That's an exercise I take through all, most of my clients on, by the way. So this is common stuff. Wow, man. <laughs> oh, GS, I almost feel like that's the place we need to end because it's like, you just, that's a mic drop idea. I almost want to end there. So guys who feel, re who resonate with this are going to go do it right now. Yeah, I am going to do that. I, I am. I'm, but here's the thing. I yeah. want to end on that being the big call to action, the big idea. And, you know, interestingly, I would love for men. And I say men, I mean me. And I'm inviting men to join me on this is to do this. Not just with your spouse, but maybe there are other people in your life that you, this would be an interesting activity to do is like with your children how might you have hurt your children and then make a list of those things and what needs to be owned, what needs to be healed or repaired. Maybe it's with your parents, right? With your, you know, my, my mom, my dad is, you know, what needs to be healed. That's actually something I talk about a lot on the show lately. Maybe it's just part of where I am in my life. GS is being, you know, I said 48 years old and, and, um, I'm at this place where so much of my 20s and 30s was about performance. How do I run faster? How do I, how do I 
for, how do I be more efficient and effective? And the last several years of my life have been what needs to be healed. Cause I was trying to dance on a broken leg. And so no matter how many dance lessons I take, <laughs> you know, no matter how much I entice myself with good music or other people, if you yeah. haven't healed the broken leg, you you know, dancing is going to be tough in a sense. Totally. Um, I, you, you're moving from how do I be more effective to how do I be more relational? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's what I heard you just say. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. John, can I say one thing? You can say anything you want, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I know you, you wanted to land the plane, but around this, this, this going back and owning stuff like you just talked about, or we just talked about, um, it's, it's, there's lots of skills you can bring to bear. And I put, and I'm going to do a shameless self-promotion here. I put those skills in this new video course, the masculine blueprint training course, you know, your audience can find it on the website, but there's a lot of skills about how to receive her pain because it's not easy. It's going to, when you open those doors, those, the floodgates that have been building up for 10 or 20 years are coming at you. So if you don't have the skills to do it and to reach her, uh, it's going to be challenging. So I've, I've put some of those skills into the, into the course. So, you know, guys can reference that if they really wanted to make a, a serious effort at, at healing all this pain, because I'm telling you, and I've gone through this myself with my woman, she needed to heal her own pain from a childhood and we needed to heal pain between the two of us. And now that we've gotten so far as we have, oh, it's amazing. Like, she's just like, like a blooming flower a lot of the time not all the time but you know there's openness and the things that delight me about her are really starting to come out very consistently because of the healing we've done in part because of you know this ownership exercise we talked about yeah i love it um we'll put the link to that in our notes i strongly encourage men to do this type of work um to take those courses to get the support i feel like that's that's critical and um, coming full circle here, you've done the same thing. You went and studied, you learned, you, and I'm guessing, I'm betting you, you still do, um, that you're a all lifelong student. Yeah. Yeah, all the so, time. So, GS, this has been awesome, man. I, I know there's so much ground that we still could talk about. There's days and days of conversation. There's endless examples and stories and nuances to all of what we've shared, but I really want to honor you for, for opening up this conversation and giving us some things to think about. You brought some new terms to me. I love this relational masculinity piece. I think that's very, very powerful. And I love the assignment at the end uh, that I'm walking away with because I think that's going to, regardless of, you know, um, I, th I think re regardless of whether or not it's quote unquote easy to do or successful, <laughs> uh, I already know it's powerful. I already know there will be healing in simply acknowledging and owning and asking and giving space for this. And you've given me a, a great pathway, which is what I always want, man. I hate feeling like there's nothing I can do. I love knowing what I can do. I love, lo I love knowing where I can take ownership because I like to be in control. So when it's, when it's on me, I'm like, cool, now I get to do something. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the power of what I'm trying to, to share with men is, you have the power to change this. You don't need her to change. Don't wait for her to change. You have the power to do it yourself. Yes. And to me, that's not like overloading the man. That's empowering them. You know, yeah. that feels good to me, just like you said. Yeah. All right, man. Hey, next time you're in Austin, hit me up. Let's, uh, let's hang in person. I love that. You got it, brother. All right, dude. Thanks so much.